one. If you'll stand as we begin our worship service this morning with the singing of the song, My Life is in You, Lord. The only announcement that I was given was the ice cream social that is scheduled for next Sunday uh, still needs ice cream and cake. So we're either going to have a social or an ice cream social, depending on how many people sign up on the sign-up sheet outside the office. So if you can help with that, that would be great. Uh, when I was supposed to be here a couple of weeks ago as worship leader, we ended up in Lincoln, Nebraska and went to see a very dear friend of mine who's in the hospital and 
Thursday afternoon when I felt it was time to call him and call his son was the moment where he was passing away. And Russell was very dear to me. He, him and I basically had almost nothing in common other than a person who we met through. And those relationships didn't really last, but ours was great. Um, inside our church bulletin, there's a list down there that if you need something, the deacon's phone numbers are listed, and if you looked to your right or to your left today, and if you noticed as people were coming in how much interaction there is between people, um, there's a great support group here, and there's a bunch of people who want to serve and care about each other, and too many times we all take each other for granted. And sometimes when a lot of people ask you how you are doing, instead of us telling them the truth, we tell them, oh, I'm fine. And everything's good. You know, the Lord gave us His Son, and the Holy Spirit is with us each day, and the Lord looks over us and is a part of our lives. But he also blessed us with a great many people who are there for us if we just give them the chance. So in my Bible, in Proverbs 17:17, 17, 17, it says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born in adversity. And the explanation is when you're in trouble, you see your who your friends really are and how helpful a brother can be. Too many times we walk away with people feeling that nobody cares where there's a lot of people who care. But the only way we know that is if we let them in and if we share and if all of us, it's not just a one-way street. If you need help, you need to let us know. And if we need to be sharing all the time and we're all tied up in a lot of busy things, Russell and I had a lot of great plans for the future, but that changed on Thursday, and it's just kind of the way life goes sometimes. So make sure that you, if you've got issues, that you let someone know and realize that you are not alone, that the Lord has blessed you with a lot of people who care. And... For everyone else, if you're looking at people and you see they have a need, even if you can't fix it and you think someone else can, let them know. If the ushers would come forward. <coughs> Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all of the blessings that you bestow upon us, the friendships, the relationships that we have, not only with you, but with all the people you bless us with around us. Lord, help us to share both in our finances and in whatever mission that you have for us, that we might go forth and be your light and carry your word into this world. Lord, help us this day and always. In Jesus' name. Because he lives. It's written by Bill Gaither. Uh, at a time in his life, in his family's life, that they were having a difficult time. Finances were hard. But at this particular time, his wife gave birth to a baby boy. And so, as you notice the words up there, uh, you'll see why he wrote the song. Because he lives, life is worth the living. <laughs>
Thank you, Lord, for, for sharing that song. Because he lives, I can face the future. Let's stand if you can, or as you are able and share with um, singing praises to God and um, another song, It Is Well, uh, hymn number 705, if you like to follow in your hymn, uh, verses 1, 3, and 4. Again, this is about someone else who, um, because of who God was in his life, he was able to face tomorrow. This person that wrote this song lost part of his family when he wrote this song. So let's remember that we have a God to praise in spite of whatever the circumstances. <laughs> present, Lord, and we are mindful that as we come together this morning, that there are many that are dealing with very 
real situations, some of them very difficult situations. And Father God, we just pray that as we come together that your presence would work, that you would work as a result of our prayers, work through our prayers. Father, we think of the many that are away traveling this weekend. We pray for uh, Jeff and Diana Mayo, Jerry and Cindy, uh, Mayo, Dick and Debbie Reeves, uh, Sharon and Delmer, uh, Yero. Um, we also think of uh, Bryce and Amy and Hannah as they're traveling, and, and others, Lord. We ask that your hand and protection would be upon them as they travel. Uh, we're so thankful that George is here again, continuing to come recover from his uh, surgery. Uh, we pray that you continue to bless and encourage him. We pray too for John Jensen as he continues to recover. We also lift to you Mike Spielman. We're thankful that he is here and ask the Lord that you would bless him and encourage him and bring healing to his body. We pray too for Chad. We're glad that he is here and pray that you just continue to strengthen and encourage him as he continues to recover from his surgery. We do lift to you the many students that have um, gone to school. Uh, we look around the room this morning and are mindful of many of them that are absent today. And we lift them to you and pray that your hand of protection would be upon them. We ask that you would uh, give them safety and we pray that you would help them to, uh, to continue to serve you and to know you and to study your word and your truth. And we do pray for all of our students, whether in kindergarten or college, Lord, that through this year, your hand of protection would be upon them. Um, Lord, we thank you for the many ways that you work. And we know, Lord, that you want to continue to work to draw us closer to you. This morning, we also think of Leo James, who is in the hospital in Salina. We ask that your hand would be upon him, that you give him comfort and strength today. And for Audrey as well, that you would encourage her. Lord, we pray now, as we come to the time of the message, we ask that you would speak to our hearts, that you would guide us and direct us and help us to learn what you would have us to learn this day for your glory. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, if you would, as you're able, if you would, yes, the children can be dismissed for Children's Church. Um, if you are able, we'll have our scripture reading, and if you would stand as you are able, we're reading Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. I look at the clock, and it's 10 minutes to 11, and I think, wow, that means I've got 42 minutes to preach. And I know some of you may say, this is going to be hard for him. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'll take the time I need. If we get out early today, we get out early, and we can be the first people to Pizza Hut, but who knows? <laughs> Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a heart, a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Again, Lord, we give you thanks for your word and pray that you would bless through it as we consider it this morning, and you would take it as an act of worship on our part. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This month we have looked at a couple different things as a church, um, different things that we do and different things that we hope to accomplish and different things God calls us to do. Uh, we talked about passing on the message, sharing it with others. We talked about fine-tuning each other. Uh, towards spiritual growth and unity. And we talked about living in humility rather than out of selfishness or conceit. This morning, we're going to look at what is probably a familiar passage for most of us. Um, we're going to see a few more things about us as a church. Things that are to be encouraged. And in fact, many versions use instead of when, when I read in the New King James and it says, let us do this, many versions say we should do this. 
And so this morning, the title of our message is Church Shoulds, or, and it's the idea of going from shoulds to doing, to do's. And that's what we want to do. We want to do these things, not just know that we should do them. We want to actually be doing them. And to understand as we get started the context, we need to realize that a lot of the book of Hebrews deals with Jesus Christ as our perfect priest and our perfect sacrifice. And so we appreciate that. You know, if you have a situation and you need to pray to God, you don't have to come to me as the pastor of the church and say, hey, Pastor Matthew, can you pass this message on to God? No, you can go directly to God. And we don't have to offer sacrifices. Of course, Scripture says our lives are to be sacrifices for God, but we don't have to come. And I'm thankful that we don't come on Sunday morning with doves and cows and things, and we slaughter them on the altar. I'm glad. Aren't you glad we don't do that? Yeah. All right. We could if you want. No, just kidding. There's no reason for it, because the perfect sacrifice has been made through Jesus Christ. But chapter 10 here really kind of concludes this discussion by discussing the perfect results of Jesus Christ's priestly work. And so much of what we see in this passage can be understood in this way. Since Jesus is our high priest, we should do these things. So as we go through this passage, we need to keep in mind, since Jesus is our high priest, we should do this. We're going to do this. We want to do this. And the first thing that we see as we look at this passage, this first of the let us's, or the first of the should's, or the first of what we want to do, is has to do with our proximity. And it's to let us draw near, or we should draw near, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. And this word to draw near... You know, we think about drawing near, and hey, Danny, how you doing? You all love when I come down off of the platform, don't you? I'm doing what? I'm drawing near to Danny. No, I almost sat on your lap. <laughs> no, just kidding. That's what we think of when we think of drawing near. And how many of you say, I'm so glad he likes Danny better than me, because no, just kidding. <laughs> we think of, you know, moving cheek to cheek, literally there. But that's, it means more than just that. This drawing near, and my wife has already given me one look today, so if I get three looks, we're just going to close in prayer. But the idea of drawing near, it's more, than just, it's more than just coming physically close to somebody or something. It's the idea of agreeing and agreeing with somebody. But there is that idea of approaching as a result of that agreement. So it says, so let us draw near, let us agree, let us come together. You know? And that's one thing that we really need and we really appreciate. Don't we like when we come together as a group of people? We talked previously about how as church when we come together, it ought to be like a family reunion. We ought to be excited, you know? When I got to see Audrey, I ought to say, hey, Audrey, what's going on in your life? And be excited and talk to Audrey, you know? You know, she shouldn't just be a number. Like we had 46 people in Sunday school this morning, which that's not so hot. But the numbers, the number of bodies aren't important, you know. It's the person. It's the individual. So we need to draw near, come together, approach one another, agree. But it says with a true heart. True. You know, and you know, scripture often uses that word, true, and we hear it. You know, we hear it all the time, and sometimes it just goes right over our head. This idea of true is probably something that we're pretty familiar with. It's that idea of being genuine, that idea of being factual, being real, you know. Now, I know we all, when we come to church, we try, except the pastor, apparently, we try to, to put our best foot forward and be on our best behavior, you know. We don't burp, we don't do this, you know, we don't kick our shoes off, we don't pick our noses, most of us anyways, right? Right? No. We try to do that, but sometimes in life we wear these masks, but that's not really who we are. And when it's talking about coming together, it's talking about being real with one another, being genuine with one another, being welcoming with one another. You know, this past week I was watching a, a Christian video and they talked about making people feel at home. And that's what the idea is. 
When we come together as a body of believers, we want you to feel at home. Now, yes, we're in a sanctuary. Yes, we come together to revere God, to worship God, to honor God. Yes, but I don't want you to sit there like you have to be perfectly still and you can't crack a smile and you can't touch the person next to you. Well, and, and don't do that unless they give you permission. But, you know, I want you to be relaxed. I want you to enjoy our time together with God. All right? It's not like you're sitting, we don't have any dentists in our church, so I can say this. It's not like you're waiting to be the next patient at the dentist. You know, oh. when we come together, it ought to be with a true heart, you know. It ought to be genuine, real. And that realness, that genuineness, that factual nature, it emphasizes the connection between what is true and the source of that truth. All right? Because again, and we've talked about this a little bit throughout this month, when we come together, we don't come here to celebrate Pastor Matthew, do we? And I'm going to ask you that again because Vicki got it right, right? She said no. When we come, we don't come to celebrate Pastor Matthew, right? Right. We come to celebrate God because God is the source of the truth. It's not Pastor Matthew, you know. It's not me. I'm not the source. I'm not the truth. It's God. And so that realness, that genuineness has got to be based on that. All right? And that's what we celebrate. But it says to draw near with a true heart. And then it talks about this idea. It talks about hearts being sprinkled and bodies being washed. And I want to encourage you that that's the idea of making sure that there's no hindrance in our relationship with God. Part of it has to do with, one, this idea of our hearts being sprinkled. That's the idea of having, again, going back to that realness, that genuineness, that truth. Having a real faith in God. Being submissive. Being, um, having genuine faith. The second one, the body's washed, is that demonstration of genuine obedience. We, of course, when we talk about the washing of the bodies, we think of what? This here, right here. The baptism, right? And baptism is an outward uh, expression or demonstration of what has happened spiritually in our lives. So as we look at this, we want to make sure that we are faithful to God and we're obedient to God. And these two demonstrations, these two phrases, talk about how we, as we come together, we, like the old song says, we need to trust and obey. Trust and obey. You know, and a lot of times, we, want to, we like the trust part, but it's that obey part. We want to kick that obey right down the curb. We want to say, we'll do the trust, let the Methodists do the obey, right? But that isn't how it works. God wants us to trust him and he wants us to obey him. And that's what we celebrate as we come together as a body of believers. That's what he's talking about here when he says, we should draw, um, draw near, we should come together, we should approach, we should agree in genuine faith and obedience. We should genuinely trust and obey God because of our connection to Him. We should draw closer to Him, nearer to Him than anyone else in our life. And that's a tall order. That is a tall order. But that's what He wants. And you know what? More than that, that's what He deserves. I love my wife. I would lay my life down for my wife. But you know what? My wife didn't die so that I could have an eternity with God. She loves me. I know she loves me. I love her. But God, Jesus Christ, did more than she could ever do. Now, I'm not trying to diminish her. You know that. But Sometimes, again, we focus on those things. And not that we shouldn't focus on our families. You know, you're all going to go out here and say, Pastor Matthew says, I don't have to think about you, honey. <laughs> Anniversaries, what are those? No. <clears throat> but my wife is not my God. I'm thankful to say that my God is my wife's God. How do we do this? How do we draw near? Well, the answer is simple, but the practice is not. As we've said, we need to get real. We need to genuinely live all those things that we say. We need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
We need to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Like that song said this morning, my life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you. We sing it. We need to live it. We need to live it when we say we shall have no other God before him. And we need to live it every day. We need to draw near as a church. As a church, Jesus Christ paid the price for our admission. Sadly, we turn our backs all too often. We turn our backs on each other. We turn our backs on God. And it's almost like we just tear up that ticket. We don't appreciate it. Drawing near means that we do. We keep it in perspective. We keep it real. We recognize who he is, what he has done. Not just for me, but for all of us. So the first should is that we should draw near. We should draw near. It has to do with proximity, getting closer. The second is, has to do with ownership or possession. And it's let us hold fast. Or we should hold fast. Fast. Now, again, hold fast is not something that, you know, we normally think of. I was trying to think of um, some kind of um, illustration or some kind of common use for this. And the only thing I could think of, and I was thinking, and this is probably a silly example, but I was thinking of those denture commercials, you know, where they put super, super grip or poly dent or whatever on the dentures and they sh you show them shoving them up in there and the seal is tight. You know, it holds fast. I told you it was a silly example, you know. But it's that idea of holding fast. But, but this idea goes further. Yes, it has the idea of, of binding together. It also has a little bit of a, an idea of restraining or holding back from other things. But there really in this hold fasting is this idea of taking possession. Taking possession. Taking ownership. You know, taking ownership. And, you know, we often talk about, you know, in church, in, in management and different things of trying to get people to buy into things, you know, because it's one thing for a leader to stand up and say, oh, we're going to do this and we need to do this. But until the people that you're talking with take ownership, take it as their own, nothing gets accomplished, does it? But once those people get excited and catch the fire and they take ownership, of the idea, then the sky's the limit. And so that's what this is talking about, this idea of holding fast, is that we need to take ownership. It's mine. It's ours. Well, what do we take ownership? It said, hold fast the confession. Hmm. Confession. What does that mean? Well, it's a profession. It's a proclamation. <clears throat> It really has a, an emphasis on the common belief, again, of the church. You know, if you look at these words and dig a little bit deeper, we see that this, again, is talking to us as a church. The confession, our belief, our proclamation, what we believe, what we say. Taking possession of that. It also carries with it an idea of, of studying the subject and drawing a conclusion. You know? Looking at something, mulling it over, pondering it. This morning we talked about that a little bit in Sunday school, that idea of pondering and studying things, looking at it in different ways, looking at it for weaknesses, you know, digging deeper. And that's the idea of this, of this confession, is that we've looked at it, we've studied it, we've tried it, and we have come to this conclusion. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Amen. That is what this is saying. Take possession of that. Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. The confession. It says the confession of hope. You know, in the scripture it says our hope. But really it is the hope, and I like that. We see in the context, though, this idea of possession of our hope. But, you know, this idea of the hope is different than just our hope. Our hope is, well, this is my hope. You might have another one. But when you say the hope, then we get the idea that there is how many hopes? There's the one. But we praise the Lord that the one hope is our hope. The hope. 
And what is that? Is an expectation of what is sure. And again, we understand that with the idea of ownership. Hold fast the confession of hope. And again, there's the idea of without wavering. Without wavering. And this is the only time that word is used in the Bible. It's kind of funny, you know, when you come across those. But what does that mean, that idea of not wavering? Well, it carries has a couple different ideas. One, it means it's not bent, it's straight. It's straight. You know, when Maddie was in um, geometry class, she would sometimes have to use a ruler. And there would be times when she didn't have a ruler. And we could always tell that she would maybe use a book or something. And books sometimes, you know, at least in our house, even though when they first come, the, the edges of the bindings are nice and straight, but over time, they get little nicks in them. And so when lines were supposed to be drawn, you could see this line, and then all of a sudden there'd be a little whoop, you know. So it wasn't quite straight, you know. It wasn't quite a perfect line. And that's what we're to aim for, is this idea of, and again, we're not going to be perfect apart from the work of the Holy Spirit and apart from Jesus Christ in our life. But not being bent, not being crooked. It also has the idea of unyielding or being resolute, you know. Now, I can be as stubborn as the next person. No amens? No, just kidding. <laughs> I can be. I can be as stubborn as the next person. There are things, you know, and, and sometimes I can be stubbornly wrong. I admit it. There are times. But there are many times in our lives when we, and there are many times in life when we aren't as resolute or as unyielding as we ought to be. We are faced with challenges, and what do we do? We just take a step back. Okay. We don't stand up when we ought to, you know. And there have been a few times in my life when I had to stand up in times and situations when I perhaps didn't want to, but it needed to be done. Are we unwavering in our proclamation of our hope? Because, see, that's what this is talking about. We say it's our hope. We say it's our belief. We say he's our God. But are we going to be unwavering in the proclamation of that? Or when people come up and, and say things, we'll just say, well, you, you can believe what you want to believe. That's okay. Or we're going to say, well, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We need to be resolute. We need to be un. Wavering. We should hold fast our confession of hope. Well, how do we do it? We practice it. We strengthen it. We own it. If it's my hope, then I need to display it. If it's my hope, then I need to live it. Sadly, you know, we're often associated with ideas or things that are not our own, you know. Sometimes spouses, because they're married to another, or married to their spouse, ideas are associated with them. Or where we work, ideas are associated with us. Or the church that we go to, ideas are associated with us. But they may not be our ideas. They may not be our positions. They may not be what we believe. But here we need to realize that this hope, this confession of hope, it isn't supposed to be the pastor's. It isn't supposed to be the congregation. It's meant to be yours. It's meant for you to own it. It's meant for you to live it. In the beginning of this passage, it talked about being bold. And that's the idea. Being bold. Now, does that mean we go around beating everybody over the head? No. Randy says yes, so stay away from him. <laughs> We don't have to beat each other over the head. Because, you know, we've talked about this scripture says speaking the truth in love. But still, we're supposed to speak the truth. First, we should get closer in our proximity, draw near. Second, we should claim ownership or possession, hold fast. And third, we should adjust our perception or our perspective. We should think. 
it tells us in Hebrews chapter 10. You know, and this particular passage is always one that I feel a little bit not hesitant to talk about, but sometimes I think, well, people go, well, of course the pastor's going to talk, because this is the passage that talks about uh, not forsaking the assembling, you know. I think people always go, well, of course, pastor, you're going to talk about that. Of course, you want people to come to church, because, pastor, you get paid by the church, and if people come to church, you get paid, you know. And I don't want you to think that I'm sharing this out of some self serving motivation. And, and, you know, people, of course, anytime, you know, you talk about this, people go, oh, Either they're like, well, good, I'm here. I'm here for the one Sunday that he talks about this, so that's good. I get a gold star. Or people will say, oh, well, I haven't been to church in a while. He's talking to me about this. No, I'm not talking specifically to any one person. I'm talking to every single one of us when we talk about this portion of the Bible. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Let us consider, or it's, we should think, we should take note we should be careful in our thoughts. We should discern or detect. It's the idea of really comprehending. All right? And it's the idea of thinking decisively to a de definite or clear understanding. You ever thought about something and, and uh, I'm a little bit fuzzy. I'm almost there, but I kind of got it. Well, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about thinking something through again until you clearly, definitively understand it. All right? And so it says, thinking about what? What are we supposed to think about? Well, the verse says, one another. One another. Now, you know, I like to talk about different words and what these different words mean, but there's not much that I can say about what this one another means. This one another means one another, each other, that person sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you. Above you. And it says we're supposed to think. We're supposed to discern. We're supposed to um, decisively think until I have a clear understanding of you. <laughs> Some of you it's harder to do with than others. <laughs> Maybe you say that about me. But for what purpose? For what purpose? Think about others for a purpose. And this implies motion into. And the idea is here, we're supposed to think about one another and interact with one another for the purpose of kind of gently guiding one another. And this goes back to what we talked about two weeks ago, that fine-tuning. We're supposed to think about one another so we can come along each other and gently guide each other on this path. And notice I said gently. You know, we don't have to shove each other. Because how many of us like to be shoved? We don't like to be shoved. But we don't mind having a gentle stroll. We're supposed to guide someone gently. What purpose? Well, it talks about love and good works. And of course, we know that the works we do, the purpose of those good works are so that people will see them and glorify God. Matthew 5. The purpose of our good works is not so I get a pat on the back and everybody says, hey, what a great guy Matthew Coleman is. The purpose of our good works is they say, hey, Matthew Coleman has a great God. <coughs> well, how do we do that? Well, we do it by assembly. <coughs> gathering together. Uniting. In this it says, do not forsake, and that's a fascinating word. You know, we think about that, forsaking. But what it really means is to desert somebody. To abandon them. I love this one. It's characterized and defined as the idea of leaving someone in the lurch. You ever had that happen to you? Somebody leave you in the lurch and <laughs> says, I'm going to be there, and they don't show up. Yeah? Was it a date in high school? They said they'd show up and never got there? No? <laughs> that goes back to the confession time. No, just kidding. Leaving us in the lurch. Leaving us, in help, leaving us helpless in dire circumstances. That's what this word forsake means. 
So we're not supposed to do that. But we want to emphasize this other part of the assembling together because here's the definition. It's a specific grouping together that fulfills the specific purpose of the gathering together. You got that? A I'll read it again. A specific grouping together that fulfills the specific purpose of the gathering together. When it's talk about this assembling, it's the idea of when we come together, we come together for a purpose, okay? We come together for a purpose, and when we come together, there's a reason that we come together. You say, well, you're saying the same thing, yes, but I want you to understand that. So this idea of forsaking is we're abandoning that or leaving that behind or leaving those in the lurch that are coming together for that purpose. Let's imagine if we would, we used to have a Helping Hands ministry and the different people would come with different things, different ingredients to make a specific dish or something that we would hand out to people. And imagine that we were going to make a pasta dish, okay? And I signed up to the bring the tomatoes and because I'm the pastor and I'm telling the story, I'm the good guy, so I'm there, all right? I got the tomatoes. All right? And Kathy White says, oh, I'll bring the cheese. So here comes Kathy, and she's here with the cheese. All right? And we'll pick Jane. Pla I'm not going to pick Greg. <laughs> we'll pick plain Jane. And plain Jane was going to bring the pasta. Right? And she doesn't show up. So here we got the tomato sauce, and we got the cheese, and Greg brought the meat. He got ground beef, so yeah. He's the head trustee. I gotta be got his good, 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 get him his good graces. But what can we do? We're missing an essential ingredient. We come together for a purpose to make this delicious pasta dish, but without the pasta, what can we make? Soup, I guess. But the purpose was to make the pasta. That's what this is talking about. As we come together, it's for a purpose. There's a purpose to the gathering. There's a purpose that is completed in the gathering together. And there's a purpose that is completely fulfilled only when all of the parts of the group are gathered together. Back to the purpose, to guiding us to love and good works. Well, it's not done. That isn't accomplished when we're not here, is it? And again, those of you who survive miss church to complain, we all miss church. All right? We all miss church. So I'm not beating anybody or smacking anybody's hands. But I'm just trying to, again, help us change our perception and to realize that when we come together for church, it's not just because it's on the schedule. It's not just because it's a tradition that we have to come. It's because when we come together, there's a purpose for this. There's a reason for this. There is something that is accomplished, and it is only truly accomplished when we are all here. When, you know, going back to our pasta analogy, you know, how much better is the pasta when you have oregano, and you have onions, and you have garlic, and you have Parmesan cheese, and you have all these different ingredients. It's better, isn't it? Now, we can get by with a plain marinara if we have to. But how much deeper and our deeper art is the flavor when all the spices and everything is there? And that's the picture here. And that's what I want you to think about. I don't want you to think that I'm smacking anybody on the hands or anything. But I want us to all appreciate that when our oregano is not here, we notice it. When our ground beef isn't here, it's a lot quieter, but we notice it. <laughs> and it goes back to what Doug, who's in the nursery now, goes back to what he was talking about. We're here because we care about each other. We are to be encouraging. And that requires a connection, doesn't it? It requires a presence. The word encourage means to, to send for, or to summon, or to beseech, to make a call personally. You know, more and more people decide that they aren't going to go to church, they're going to watch church on television, you know, and, and that is sometimes a good alternative if you just can't make it. But, you know, it doesn't quite do it. You don't get the same connection as when we come together 
get our hearts focused on the same God, celebrate what he's doing. That's the purpose. We should have a new perspective or perception on the congregation. Well, how do we, how do, we do that? Well, we recognize that our talk sometimes doesn't live up to our walk. You know, when we say what's important, what's the most important? Well, our faith, our faith is most important for God, you know. But in many churches around the world, that simply, sadly, doesn't seem to be the case. You know, many people, if we think about their work schedule, they never take a day off of work. They never miss a day of work. In 25 years, they never missed a day of work. They come in sick. You know, there's no excuse too great to take them out of work. But when it comes to church, when it comes to assembling together, when it comes to what we say is truly important, and you know, it's happening in churches all over the world. Any excuse to draw people out of church. What excuse is good enough? None, really. Now, having said that, do we all miss church from time to time? Yes. And that's okay. But if we consistently miss, that's the issue. We might ask, why is it so important? Why is it so important that we be faithful to church? Well, if we think about it again, if you think about it in work, let's say in church in a year, maybe you come, some people only come Christmas and Easter, right? So out of three, you know, 52 Sundays, they come too, all right? Now, you imagine, you know, you go to your employer and you're scheduled for 52 days of work and you show up for two. They're going to give you a raise and a promotion. No, right? You know, in, in Michigan, I was telling them about how um, when I was in high school, I had to give a speech on hockey, and I know nothing about hockey. But I do know that it's a team, and they have to work together. Imagine now if, if I was a player, and this you're going to have to stretch your imaginations pretty far from this. Imagine if I was, I can't even tell you a hockey position, but if I was on the Detroit Red Wings, right? Imagine there's 52 practices, and I show up for two of them. How many games am I going to play in? None, because I'll be in court because they'll be suing me because my contract, I haven't showed up for the practices and stuff. But this is just the idea, it's a silly example. But if we say our faith is important, and we say our church is important, and we say that these people in the congregation are important, then what? We ought to be here. And not that we want you here for, for us, but we do. But we want you here for you. We want to encourage you as you encourage us as we all come together to worship the Lord. Now, again, this is where you say, well, this is, of course, what the pastor says because the pastor, it's, you know, get people in the church because we want 350 people in the church. Well, you know what? It would be nice to have 350 people in this church. It wouldn't be. But I don't care if we don't have 350 people in this church. But I want you in this church. Quiet. We need to go where it's most important. We are one body. We are one team. We are one church. And you know, it's the same in churches all over the country. And sadly, churches all over the country, you know, we were talking in Sunday school, church, church, Attendance is in decline all over the world because there's other things to do, other things that seem more important. But if, if our faith is really the most important thing, we should be here. Amen. As a church, we are a called out assembly. We are called to unite. We are called to come to worship together, to strengthen each other for service and for worship of our king. It's a team. And we need our catcher and our pitcher. I'll go to baseball because I know that better. Catcher and pitcher and shortstop and first base and second base. And we even need the right fielder. You know, I know right field's not fantastic because that's always where they put me. <laughs> but when the ball goes out there, you need somebody who can pick it up off the ground because I'm sure not going to catch it. But... 
We need them all. So how do we consider, how do we think about one another? We realize that coming to church, it's not about me. It's about God. And it's about us. It's not about me. It's about us as a body. Us as one congregation. Us as one team. This month we have been exploring what it means to be in a church. We know that we have a message. We have a legacy, a testimony to share. We also know that we are called to tune up one another, tune in to one another in love to improve our walk with God and our relationship with each other. We know that we are not called to put self first. We're not called to be selfish or conceited, but to live lives that are humble and lowly. And today, we need to move from the shoulds into a place where we're practicing this, where we're drawing near, where we're holding fast, where we're considering one another. Of course, all of this is only possible again through the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so today, we want to make sure that every single one of us that are here this morning knows Jesus Christ as the Lord, recognizes the fact that all of us have sinned, every single one of us, not one person that is here today, is free of sin. We have all sinned, but thanks be to God, He sent His Son, Jesus, who died on the cross, and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The gift of God is forgiveness and redemption from that sin. And so today, we want to make sure that each and every one of us have met Jesus, that we have welcomed Jesus into our lives as our Lord and our Savior, because He is the way the truth, the life, the hope, the only way, the only truth, truth, the only life, the only hope is through Him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You so much for the opportunity to come together this day. We thank You for what it means to be part of a church. And Lord, we all need to be encouraged, to be challenged, to be motivated, to recognize that it isn't just a social club. It isn't just a time to visit with friends. And though we appreciate the times of fellowship, it is an opportunity for us to come together to strengthen one another and to strengthen our relationship with you. And we celebrate that. And we want to encourage each and every one of us to make a commitment to you. Father, we thank you for all that you've done, for all that you're doing. And we do pray that we will be people that will trust you and obey you. That we will be people that are willing to surrender everything so that we may serve you more, serve you better, serve each other in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we have our hymn of invitation, which is the song, I Surrender All.
again, we want to remind you about the Ice Cream Social next week and the Sunday evening service. Next Sunday, we are blessed to have Reverend Dr. David Shire, who is the Executive Director of the uh, Crossroads Camp and Conference Center. He's going to be coming uh, to Clay Center, and he's going to share about the ministry there. So we invite you to come for the Sunday School Breakfast next week at 9.15. They're going to have breakfast casseroles, so make sure to be here. And then in the worship service, he will share a message as well. Also, we want to invite you to come this evening at 6.30. We're looking at Revelation chapter 5. So let's be dismissed in prayer. Father, we ask that you go with us now as we go to our homes or other destinations. And we do pray that you would help us to appreciate the ministry of the church in our life and, and the part that we play in you working through that church, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.